Welcome to our 75th Lombardi Live, if you can believe that. And if you can't believe it, there's 75 of them you should be looking at because a lot of great interviews with a lot of great drummers with a lot of great information. You know, things have slowed down for drummers that I know over the past years, but nobody told that to my guest tonight because he's one of the busiest guys on the planet. Along with being a great drummer, he's an author, educator, historian, producer, and he's one of the classiest guys you'll ever meet. In fact, his AKA is going to be Daniel Glass. That's what I call him sometimes, but his real name is Daniel Glass. Daniel, thank you for joining me tonight. Don, it's good to see you, man. It's really great to be here, and uh, I, I, I am tickled pink by your introduction. Thank you. Very and kind. Before we came on, you said you had something that you were gonna you were gonna show me when we started. What was that? Yeah, look at look at this picture here. I'm gonna show you guys. Grab, grab that. Glare. So this is a picture that was taken at an AM show a few years ago, but it's three of my tip it three. tip it down a little bit in front so oh, it's not on a glare. Yeah, there, yeah, there we go. There you go. Okay. Okay. Got it. Three of the of my great mentors and probably yours too, but all all have now departed the planet. Freddie Gruber. Yep. On this side. Next to him, Louis Belson, and over here, the great Earl Palmer. And all three of these gentlemen were great teachers, mentors, and friends to me. I, I really consider the fact that uh, I was able to get to know them and, and befriend them all uh, a huge, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the great honors of my life, especially that I study the traditions. And all three of these guys are truly pioneers in, in each of their specialties you know i mean l beyond legendary you know i mean earl palmer basically is the architect of rock drumming louis belson <laughs> i mean what do you even say is one of the maybe in the top five all-time great swing and jazz drummers of the uh, ever and of course freddie you know gruber uh, legendary visionary teacher and i got them after the picture was taken I hunted them all down over the next couple of years with a gold pen and got them all to sign for me. So if you don't mind, I'd like to read you what they wrote. Please, I'd love to hear that. Freddie being the last because the most humorous. So Earl Palmer wrote, Danny, they all call me Danny for some reason. Nobody calls me Danny except my mother and these guys. Danny, a wonderful musician and a great friend, Earl Palmer. How's that? Amazing. Louis to Daniel, all love, Louis Belson. And now, Freddie, to Danny, a documenter of the music. Well done, your teacher, Freddie Gruber. Okay, Freddie didn't, Freddie didn't say I was a good drummer. <laughs> a documenter of the music. There you go. All right, that, Freddie, that, thanks. That's a, that's a big compliment from Freddie, so take it. Take it as a positive. Yeah. And, <laughs> and how important it is, you know, I was so honored to have Louis out uh, in... Uh, last years of his life but he was still feeling really good and we did a round table with a lot of his friends which is part of the totally. mantra as you know of drum channel is to have an, an archive vault of all this great information and talk about yeah. historian i mean just with those people right there talk about the importance of the kids learning not just uh, how they influenced other drummers but what about their playing that influenced you yeah well i mean it's interesting because when I, I I moved to Los Angeles, I live in New York now, but I spent 20 years in L.A. And I first moved there to go to music school in 1991. And I wanted to be Vinnie Caliuta, you know, and like everybody else, be like the, you know, the hot super session dude. And life has this weird way of just taking you in directions you never thought you were going to go in. And after I got out of school, I had a couple of rough years just trying to, you know, figure it out and start a professional career in Los Angeles. It was brutal. And then I fell into this this band, Royal Crown Review. And what I learned about in Royal Crown Review, the band was really focused on uh, what I would say is like classic styles of American music. So everything from traditional jazz to swing, big band, uh, bebop, rhythm and blues, rockabilly, jump blues, early rock, you know, and... I didn't really know the difference between all these things when I joined the band. And uh, there was a period where I was just trying to play everything like Tony Williams. And didn't work they were in not that band, no. That. They were not digging that. They're like, well, you're a good drummer, but what you're doing is not right. And it kind of got rough. And I was sort of afraid I was going to maybe lose the gig, which, you know, I'm glad I didn't. But I, the uh, baritone player made me a cassette of like 
th- these are these are the artists that that we're into. This is the music we're trying to sound like, or the direction we want to go in. You know, there were it, it was sort of like so. I had to go back and really relearn, and that set me off on a on a journey. Um, and then I began to, uh, we'd be in some town and they'd say, well, if you're going to be in, you know, Nashville, you got to look up Buddy Harmon, you know, who's the guy who played on all the great, um, you know, uh, country records. He played on, uh, all the Patsy Cline. He played on Roy Orbison's Pretty Woman. You know, you gotta, if you're going to be in, uh, in Jackson, Tennessee area, you got to look up W.S. Holland. He was on Blue Suede Shoes with Carl Perkins, and he was Johnny Cash's drummer for 40 years. He's on the Folsom Prison record. Oh, do you know, you know, you're living in L.A., do you know Earl Palmer? You know, played on Little Richard's, all the great Little Richard and Fats Domino, and then he was on all the Eddie Cochran. And so meanwhile, I'm in this world where I'm learning about all these things, and then people keep telling me about all these drummers who were the guys that played on these records, and I'm trying to learn about how to play this stuff. So once I ended up meeting these drummers and getting to know them, you know, these guys are just three examples, but there was a lot, a lot of drummers. Then I realized like there's, there's, these are human beings, you know, and this music is vibrant and it's alive and it's incredible. Then I start to realize when you look at say an early John Bonham solo, what is he, what is he doing? He's doing, um, you know, he starts off his solo doing like a bunch of snare work that's totally uh, similar to like Joe Morello, then he then he literally cops Max Roach's uh, a drum also waltzes. He literally plays that. John Bonham, you know, plays that in his in his solo. And then you know you realize like Fool in the Rain is something from Bernard Purdy. And then you realize that you know Gene Krupa was his idol. And when Led Zeppelin first played on the stage at Carnegie Hall, he was so excited because. His favorite album was the 1938 Benny Goodman Live at Carnegie Hall record. So then you begin to see how all these things tie in with each other. And you begin to understand that, say, if you want to play like John Bonham, knowing more about what John Bonham was excited about, you know, reggae music. He was into reggae because that was happening. And, he, you know, so then there's this Led Zeppelin tune called Jamaica. Jamaica, right? And it's kind of their reggae tune. So, you know... It's people think, oh, John Bonham, but you know he was like some kind of standalone superhero of groove. No, he wasn't. He was influenced by all the things around him. And so what I realized then is that if if you want to play like your heroes, or you want to understand more about the music that you love, if you can find out a little bit about what influenced those drummers, it's going to make you play that music better. You know, and I mean just from there. You know, I, I I had I had a bachelor's degree before I went to the Dick Grove School of Music in L.A. I had a bachelor's degree from a university called Brandeis University, and it was in psychology. I really didn't even think I was going to become a professional drummer until I got out of college. And luckily there, I had developed some skills in researching and writing. And uh, so I had felt like, you know, when I went into music just full time, that I wasn't nurturing that side of myself, which, you know, is a side of myself. I'm kind of an intellectual person and I like to, uh, to, to write and I like to read and I like to learn. And not that musicians don't like to do those things, but it's a little bit different than what the typical musician is doing. So uh, I began to write um, articles and, you know, that's kind of how I got into all of this. Meeting these guys and seeing that they were humans and then being so in awe of them because of, I mean, Earl Palmer, man, it's like every great drummer of the British invasion was influenced by Earl Palmer. They all loved Little Richard. They all loved Fats Domino. They all loved Eddie Cochran. They all loved Richie Valens. They, you know, he's the drummer on all of those. He played on so many influential early rock and roll tunes. He, he, he created the genre. So to be in his presence, you know, you're just, to me, is like the most awesome thing. So anyway, as usual, very long-winded answer to your question, but that's, I feel like once I got into the history and began to understand the big picture, it it just made my whole life as a drummer so much more rich, you know, and, and exciting and um, connected me. I think that's something that maybe a lot of drummers, they learn a lot of chops or this or that, but they don't really feel connected, you know, 
And it's sort of like this huge timeline, right? And right now, when we're here on this planet, we're alive, we're on that timeline. And the people coming after us, they're going to be there, people that came before us. But we could see ourselves being part of this huge story of drumming as it unfolds. It's To me, it's exciting, and it makes me feel connected to it all. So you're such, a, you're such an important part of carrying that torch, too. Uh, I'm trying, you're, baby. <laughs> you're, you're, you're doing it as a drummer, and you're doing it by looking at the past and the future and seeing how people can continually connect those two areas. And one of the things that I'm most proud about uh, in my career is the project we did, which is the Century Project. Of all the projects I've done, there's been a handful of them that stand out in my mind. And that, that explain a little bit about that. The Century we're talking about is 1865 to 1965. Yes. Well, through sort of playing in the band, interviewing all these guys. We talked about Louis Belson. I literally once spent uh, a whole day with Louis at the old Remo factory in North Hollywood, which they turned into like an education center, and he was a big Remo guy. And one day I picked him up at his house in the valley. We drove to North Hollywood. I brought a, a, a 1920s, 26 inch bass drum with calfskin heads and a snare drum and a ride cymbal and maybe a hi-hat. And I sat down with him, and for two hours we talked about, I asked him every question I could, and he demonstrated for me the old style techniques and how they played, and we talked about, you know, Dave Tuff and his, and his famous Chinese symbol and how you keep calf heads from, you know, uh, either getting too dried up and stretching too much or getting too wet and f flapping, you know, people that don't know. The old school heads are made of animal skin, and they're very respondent to weather, to humidity, to heat, to cold, to its moisture. Um, we spent two hours just talking about all this stuff, and he just regaled me with stories. Uh, so, um, you know, I got more and more and more into this, and finally I realized, and I started doing clinics where I would talk about the evolution of the drum set. And, you know, I began to realize that there was this bigger story to tell. Uh, about about the story of the drum set. And the reason why is that it's kind of cool because the drum set, we really have kind of a definitive beginning point of the drum set, right? Other instruments, you know, go back hundreds and hundreds of years. The drum set really only goes back to about the time of the Civil War, 1865. And so then I said, well, you know, where could I end the story? And for me, where the story ends is where sort of the modern drum set that we know today, which how we play it sort of in a popular music setting, which is, you know, hi-hat timekeeper, ride cymbal timekeeper, toms to play fills that go high to low, and then you crash on a crash cymbal on beat one, right? And even though there's a lot of variations on that theme, we still really, uh, that's the drum set that is our model today. However, that model really didn't show up until about 1965, the British invasion. And so I found this century, 1865 to 1965, where we were able to kind of tell the story of the drum set within that century in a way that made sense. And then I went to you, Don, <laughs> because I didn't know what to do with this. And, um, and you were just wonderful and so supportive. And we ended up making two DVDs about six hours worth of stuff it was a monumental massive titanic project but um you know with your incredible support and uh and encouragement i really think we came up with something very special and it's something that i think kind of because it tells this story it's sort of outside the bounds of time so hopefully whatever format people will experience it in a hundred years from now, it'll still make sense in the same way that it made sense when it came out in whatever, 2011, you know? And it's not just the experience of learning about the physical drum set. It's more and equally important about the music that transpired during that time, which would you say in some cases, the music dictated new innovations around the drum set, or in some cases, innovations around the drum set allowed you to create new music? I think you're you're exactly right. It's sort of chicken and egg, but the the one thing that um always strikes me about the drum set is that what we do as drummers, say if we're playing different styles of music, 
the way we play the drum set, the instruments we choose to keep time on, the way we play fills, that defines that era of music maybe more than any other instrument, right? Because the drum set itself was, a, you know, that 100-year period, the drum set went through radical change every 10, 15, 20 years. It was completely a different instrument than what it had been as new elements were added. You know, of course, it just started with a bass drum, a snare drum, and a cymbal. Um, and so drummers, the first drum set players, kind of had to figure out how to just keep time on those instruments. There was no hi-hat. There were no toms the way we know them today. There wasn't even really a ride cymbal. And so as, as each of those elements showed up, uh, it was sort of in response to a need by drummers to fulfill certain musical uh, questions, you know, that that were happening around them. How do I come up with a different sound to accompany the way that the music is now evolving? So the drum set is, you know, that's what I love about it is that it, it, you can identify different styles of music by what the drummer is playing. You can really like, it's a, it's a, it's a, and if you don't know those things, then you're not really going to be able to nail those styles, you know? And by the way, your introduction at the beginning, why do I work so much? Why do I work 200 gigs a year, you know, for the last four or five years continuously, except for the pandemic year, but is because I am very, very knowledgeable about all those different styles of music. And so people hire me to play one kind of thing, and then they hire me to play another kind of thing. Or the gig I do at Birdland every Monday night, it's an, kind of an open mic night, like a very crazy kind of high level open mic night. And every week we play, it's just a trio, piano trio, but we, we may do a 20s thing. We may do a country thing. We may do a rhythm and blues thing. We may do a boogie woogie thing. We may do a Sinatra thing. We may do a, a funk thing. We may do a rock thing. How with just a small, you know, jazz drum set and a piano trio, do you create those moods and really put people in that style within five seconds. You know, we have, we have no idea who's going to come up and sing with us or sit in or do whatever they're going to do. And so that's kind of, I'm very, you know, I, that's how I got that gig because whatever person came up, I immediately knew exactly where to put it based on whatever style, whatever song they called, whatever style they called. And um, it's, uh, so that keeps me very gainfully employed. And I try to tell people all the time, you know, that's really what, like understand your history and you will be employable. Yeah. That's, that's, listen, I don't, that's a very, there's a lesson that you can get in these Lombardi live interview shows and all the <laughs> interviews we have on, on drum channel. I often say you can learn more sometimes than getting behind the drum set and picking up a couple of new fills or figures uh, by just hearing these great stories from people who are, who are actually living it. And in this century project too, just want all of you out there to know that uh, in the Century Project, Daniel actually plays in a band that you put together. That that different much many different lineups, different, actually different lineups of different people that you knew who were good for certain styles of music. Yeah, I, I found I had all the experts from these different genres, uh, you know, come in, and and we have performances to accompany uh, all the styles, and we're using period drums. Yeah, for all the styles, we had a massive amount of gear that we brought in because I'm also into the to the gear itself, and that was the two the two DVD package was you know the Century Project was itself about all the the evolution of the music and how the drum set evolved, and then we would use the the, the different vintage drums to perform. Then we had a DVD called Traps where we actually sat down with John Aldridge, who's one of the experts on vintage drums, and we. We got, I got. I went down to the Memphis drum shop, Jim Pettit's wonderful shop. He's one of the great collectors of catalogs, and I took about 600 pictures of his uh, catalog collection because I already knew the drum sets that we were using in the Century Project, so I found all those drum sets and catalogs and tons of others. So in the Traps DVD, you, you get taken through... Um, you get taken through the same hundred year story basically, but from the perspective of the gear. And if you're a gearhead, we talk about every kind of, you know, gear evolution imaginable from, you know, the the badges and the finishes and the shell construction and, you know, it, it sounds dry, but it's actually 
really a fun and entertaining walk through with one of the world's great experts. And um, we rented, I don't know if you remember, we rented this revolving platform. So each one of the drum sets, it was like uh, like a car show, you know, where the where the new the new models are turning on the on the uh, the rotator the rotating platform, and we have these beautiful period correct drum sets in all their glory, and we shot each one from above and in front, and just have it turning. And so while John is talking about these drum sets, you see them from above, and it was it was really quite an elaborate project. <laughs> As I recall, at one point, when the motor didn't work, if you see a guy on the floor moving it around in the back, that's me laying down, trying to stay out of the camera shot, pushing, oh, it, God, we had, pushing it as oh, smoothly man, as I could it was around. crazy. I think we lost about a, a half a day or something because we couldn't, the, the, the motor died on the platform. Yeah, it was, there was a lot of stress too, but it, uh, it came out beautifully. <laughs> 